Well, normally I, uh, I ask everyone to stand for worship. Y'all are already good to go. I love to start with this one because there's no better way, no better way to drive away whatever you're dealing with this morning, whatever you came in with. We're just here to worship, right? I 
search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Then mm. you came along And put me back together And every desire Is now satisfied Thank you, Father.
You are the reason we are here today, Lord. It is, it's nice to have community. But you're the one who brings us together, no matter what our walk of life is. You're the great uniter. You're the God of turnarounds. Worth every ounce of our praise. Thank you for sending your son. For giving us a reason to live. For loving us and giving us a way to live on forever and ever with you. In your name.
you, Father, for sending your son. Isn't that the greatest reminder, though? No matter what you do, you cannot save yourself. It was finished through Jesus, what he did on the cross and when he rose again. That was it. If you're trying to earn your way to heaven today, you failed. But you still can go. That's the most beautiful thing in the world. Thank you, Jesus. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. stop working never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop And you are way make me 
Amen. Give it up for God. All glory to you, God. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat, will you? They told me I could have a few minutes to share my heart and my story, and I never pass that up. I like to talk. I, uh, I don't know why. It's weird, I've been told, but hey. Here I am. My name is Evan Egger. It's, uh, it's such a blessing to be invited here to Shoal Creek uh, Baptist Church. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I've been doing music full time uh, for phew, coming up on five years, actually. Uh, it's been the greatest blessing. But one thing a lot of people don't know about me is that before, before I entered into a world of, of Christian music, I used to be a, a bilingual elementary school teacher. And it was, uh, it was the coolest, most life-changing thing. And I said bilingual elementary school teacher because I actually, I speak Spanish. I don't look like I do, but I do. And uh, I, I got to teach kids who had immigrated strictly from Central and South America who had moved to our country looking for a better life, our amazing country. My mom was one of those kids, actually. And so it was an honor to work with, with immigrant kids. But one thing I didn't know when I signed up for that job was that I'd be in working strictly with an immigrant population, the poverty rate was gonna be absolutely staggering, right? So I walk kids through things I don't believe kids should have to go through. You know, I, I remember, and this was not in the South, this was in Washington State. Uh, I remember a little girl who was falling asleep every day in January in the classroom, and it was because her family had no heat, and the most comfortable place she could find to sleep was the classroom. I remember a kid who, he was a third grader, he showed up, he smelled like urine, and it was because he shared a bed with three other kids. His little brother wet the bed overnight. His mom worked night shifts. He just came to school doing his best. You know, these are the kind of things that had me wondering, if this is the better life people are coming to, what's happening around the world? And it got my, it got my, heart, it got my heart set on international affairs. And, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't all struggle, because there was the brightest point in my teaching career, and I remember it changed everything. A little girl named Damari showed up she transferred to our class a couple months late into third grade, and, and we were in the middle of a busy class project, and I didn't have anywhere to put her except for in one group, and it was the accelerated group. You know the group that goes the extra mile on the project? Oh, yeah, some of you are like, oh, yeah. Some of you are nodding because you were that kid. Some of you are nodding because you're like, oh, yeah, those kids. But, <laughs> but yeah, I put her in that group because it's where, where there was space, and she just did so well with them, and she stuck it out with them all year, and she kept on doing well, and she ended up being my star student. She, she actually showed up with no English at all, and by the end of the year passed state testing in English at an advanced level. She was amazing, this amazing kid, so I'm writing up her glowing report card, and I came across her previous teacher's notes, and I read them, and, and this is what they said. They said, Damari struggles with simple math. Damaris can't finish basic books. She does not participate. Damaris is on track for failure. And I'm asking, how can this be the same kid? What changed? What on earth changed? Let me tell you something. One thing had changed, and one thing only. It's that when she transferred classes, suddenly every preconception of where she was heading in life was stripped away. That's it. That's what changed. And suddenly she was, she was surrounded with people who believed in her, a teacher, fellow students, counselors, everybody believed and said, of course you're bound for success. She was equipped with what she needed for success. She had curriculum, school lunches, a good classroom. But suddenly, when those preconceptions stripped away, her God-given potential just blossomed. And it's kids like Damaris that make me so proud to work with Compassion International everywhere. Everywhere I go, I share about it because what they do every day is just like what happened for Damaris. You see, when a, when a sponsor lets Compassion step into a child's life, they are suddenly equipped with everything they need for success. There's food on the table, they're put into a school, medical bills are covered, but more than that, there are people speaking truth and goodness into their lives. Suddenly, they have a sponsor they have a teacher, they have a pastor suddenly, and that God-given potential that they have just blossoms. It's the coolest thing in the world because the struggles and the obstacles that people face around the world, not just Latin America, by the way, I'm talking all around the world, are very different from our American poverty. Most people around the world live lives where if they don't work that day, they're not going to eat that day. That's a different kind of poverty. And especially these last two years, governments have come and they've said, it's unsafe to work. You cannot work, but also no government aid is coming. And families have been left to starve to death. That's the reality of what happens around most of the world right now. So let me tell you something. We're here at church because we serve a God that does not know impossible. 
Amen? We serve a way maker, a miracle worker. So when he reaches down into a pit that the world says is too deep and he lifts a child out of that, there's no doubt for a moment it was the hand of God. And I want to tell you what happens when you sponsor a kid with compassion because that's my heart. God gave me this heart for kids since I was a kid. I knew I wanted to do something with kids. And I want to tell you what happens. It's when you sponsor a child, it's $38 a month. And it's first thing you should know is it's not a social services organization. It's not the government showing up. It's the hands of Jesus. It's the child's local church that is able to step into their life. And there's food, medical bills, and education all provided for for that child. But this is what really happens when you sponsor. Someone from the local church knocks on the child's door and they say, God made you, God sees you and loves you and values you. And there's someone in Decatur who saw you and said, absolutely, you are worth it. You're made in the image of God. And because of that, all your your needs are going to be met. But more than that, y'all, the gospel of Jesus Christ enters this child's home. They discover that they have a savior who was born for them, who lived, who suffered, who died for them, who rose again with them on his mind. That's the value of their life. And let me tell you something, it's not Having your needs met is one thing, but let me tell you something. It's suddenly being told your true value in the eyes of God and in the eyes of someone else out there. That's the life-changing moment, and you see those preconceptions strip away. It's the most amazing. It's like a physical change, that moment of sponsorship. It's the most beautiful thing you will ever experience, seeing a kid discover that they were chosen, that they were worth choosing. Y'all, if you want to be a part of that joy today, I want to make it easy. I want to connect you with a kid. I have one or two volunteers here. Could you, could you stand? Yeah, could you go ahead and stand up? Would, if you want to get connected with a kid, would you just slip your hand into the air, and he'll, he'll, he'll slip a packet into your hand. It's that simple. So go ahead and slip those hands up. I believe he has. I see that hand right there. I see that hand over there. Go ahead and slip it up. And let me tell you something. I want to tell you about these packets. It's this simple. Oh, he's going out to get them. Keep those hands up for me, will you? <laughs> It's this simple. You fill out the front and back of this packet. There's contact info and payment info. It's $38 a month. And once you get it, did you guys see the, pa- the compassion table when, when you came in? There's one right out to the left there. Once you give me that little slip, I'm going to overnight it to compassion, and kids are going to get sponsored. It's that simple. And, you know, my wife and I, okay, he's back with the packets. Go ahead and <laughs> lift them a little higher so he can see them. Um, it's this simple. And my wife and I, we do something amazing. We have a 10-year-old daughter and an 8-year-old son. My 10-year-old daughter sponsors a 10-year-old girl. My 8-year-old son, right over there. My 8-year-old son sponsors an 8-year-old boy. It's the coolest relationship in the world. They're constantly writing to each other. If you're a grandparent, you can also sponsor for your grandchildren. It's the coolest thing. I've seen many, many grandparents sponsor on behalf of their grandkids. Or if you want to just know more about this, come talk to me at the table, will you? There's no shortage of kids looking for sponsors. Go ahead, keep those hands coming up. There's no shortage of kids looking for sponsors. If you... I've got a hand up here in the front. If you've got a heart for a region or an age, talk to me about it. After service, I'm going to be at the compassion table, and we're, we're going to celebrate changing the world together because the church got together. Amen? All right. Thank you all so much for hearing me, for hearing my heart. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, brother. Yeah, amen. <laughs> amen. Amen, and it's good to be with a pastor who has a built-in microphone. 
<laughs> I just thought that was pretty amazing. Here I am all wired up, and he just gets up and talks. <laughs> hey, it's good to be in church this morning. Amen? Amen? Evan, I sure enjoyed you. You fit in with what's on the wall. I was looking at the wall as he was singing and sharing about real people, a real Savior, real change, real church. I think Evan's real. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah I felt like the presence of the Lord was with us this morning, and I don't know what swaggerty is, but I need some of it. I guarantee you I need some swaggerty. I don't even know what it is. It may not even be a good thing. <laughs> but you got it. Whatever it is, it's good. Amen. Go ahead and take your Bible, 2 Kings chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading there at verse number 1. It's the story of Naaman the leper. He's an unbeliever, if you will. He's an outsider. He's a Syrian. He would have even been hated and despised in his day. But God is about to do a work in his life. The unbeliever is going to become a believer. He's going to believe that there is no God other than the God of Israel. What a good story it is. And I pray that somewhere in it you might see yourself. 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning reading at verse number 1. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, there he is, the outsider, an unbeliever, an ungodly culture. He was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. Yes, God has a way of using the ungodly to bring about a good result, and he did it there, and I still believe he can operate like that, and so he used an ungodly nation to bring discipline to the people of God. He was a mighty man of valor. If you underline things in your Bible or highlight them, those three words at the very end of that verse, but a leper. I don't know who you may be today, and I don't know how mighty or how great your name may be. I don't know about your wealth, your prestige, your education, your past, but I guarantee you, you have a need that only God can meet. Does anybody agree with that? But if you're lost today, I guarantee you, you have a need to be saved, but you're not where you need to be with God. I can guarantee you today that God is more than willing to restore you. God is more than able to bring you back to the place where you need to be. Anybody believe that? It's a big but right there in Scripture. But he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and they brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. Now, this is good too because suddenly among the ungodly you have the presence of a godly young lady. And she knows something about the power of God. She knows something about the Word of God. She knows something about a prophet of God. And so now in an ungodly culture you have the presence of a young girl that has known the power of God. She waited on Naaman's wife, verse 3. She said to her mistress, If only, if only my master somehow knew the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. Now Naaman went in and told his master the saying, and Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel, and then the king of Syria said, Go, go now. I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. There's something there that we need to learn. He's going, if you will, with payment in his hand. He's got gold. He's got silver. He's got many changes of clothing. He's got all the wealth and gifts that you can imagine in his hands. But may I say today that God is not interested in your silver. God is not interested in your gold. God wants you. Amen? It's a good word today. I think we try to impress him with what we can bring. But God is interested in you. And then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And the king of Israel misunderstood. Read on, it happened. 
When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes. It's a sign of disbelief or grief. And he said, am I God to heal and make alive? that this man sends me a man to heal him of his leprosy. Therefore, please consider him how that this man seeks a quarrel with me. He wasn't seeking a quarrel. He was just writing a letter that his servant might be healed, verse 8. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes. He sent to the king and said, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me. But he may know that there is a prophet and not just a prophet, but that he may know there's a prophet of God in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and his chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. If this is modern day 2022, instead of showing up with horses and a chariot, He would show up with a fleet of Mercedes, if you will. It was a show of power. It was a show of prestige. Naaman, the mighty man of valor, is at the door. But oh, the response from the prophet of God. Verse 10, Elisha didn't even answer the door. He didn't even get up. He didn't move himself from his desk or his recliner, if you will. Elisha sent a message with a messenger and said to him, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times. Your flesh will be restored to you and you shall be clean. Now, why didn't Elisha get up? Because Elisha believed in the Word of God more than he believed in himself. Yes, Elisha could have gotten up and answered the door, but he knew this. The Word of God is much more than the presence of me. Yes, I could go to the door, but maybe he will just hear the Word of God. If he could only know the Word from God, go wash seven times in the Jordan. That is the Word from God, and you shall be clean. But, there's always a but, but, Naaman was furious. Have you, ever, have you ever been upset with what God told you to do? Have you ever not wanted to do what God was telling you to do? Amen. Suddenly I feel led to preach on lying. Y'all going to have to get with me out there. <laughs> Good gracious. I mean, has God ever told you something to do and you didn't want to do it? No. He was furious. Maybe you've been angry with God. Maybe bitter with God because God is leading you. God is directing you. God is showing you. God is telling you to do something that you just don't want to do. And Naaman became furious, and this was his response to God. Maybe maybe you've given God some advice before. He became furious. He went away and said, Behold, I thought to myself, Surely, He'll come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and he will wave his hand over the place and I'll be healed of the leprosy. And are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could, could I not wash in them and be made clean? Listen, friend. If he had washed in any other water other than the water of Jordan, all he would have been was wet. The healing was not going to happen because of the water. The healing was going to happen because of his obedience to the Word of God. Amen. I thought I'd amen that one myself. (laughs) That is a good word. His healing was not going to come because of the power of the water, but because of the power of the Word of God. Just do what God tells you to do and stand back and watch God's faithfulness in response to your obedience. Amen? And so he went. He went eventually and watched. He turned away, and he went away in a wrath. His servants came near. Went away in a rage. His servants came near. And they spoke to him, and they said, Hey, at least that's my take on it. Hey, master, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, I mean, would you not have done it? If he if had asked you to do something great, would you not have done it? Why, why not then? 
when he says to you, wash and be clean. Boy, I like the way the next verse begins. So he went. It's one thing to know what God's telling you to do. It's another thing to do what God's telling you to do. It's one thing to know where you need to go. It's completely another thing when you go where you need to go. Amen? That's a good word today. So, he went. He went and dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God and his flesh his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean and he returned to the man of God he and all his aides and they came and stood before him and said indeed <laughs> now I know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel and so he pleads with him to take the gifts. What I want you to see is back in verse 11 and over there in verse 15. In verse 11, he said, Behold, I thought. In verse 15, Now I know. Most of us are living somewhere between what we thought and what we know. In fact, all of us, I believe, until we draw our last breath, we'll be living somewhere between what we thought and what we know. Naaman is the perfect example. Behold, I thought this is what would happen. Behold, I thought this is what God would do. Behold, I thought this is what the prophet of God would do. Behold, I thought this is the way things would work out. But now I know. Can anybody relate to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years or more past your life, back in your life? You thought things would work out. I thought my life would be like this. I thought I would do this. I thought I would go there. This is the way I, would th I thought it would work out. But now, much further in your journey, you look back and you see how that God was directing. You look back and see how that God was redirecting. You look back at how God was leading. You look back at how God was changing your course. You look back at how God may have changed your life. And you thought, it would work out like this. You thought you would go there. You thought you would marry her. You thought you'd marry him. You thought you'd go here. You thought you'd take that job. You thought it would work out like that. But now, looking back and seeing the hand of God on those days when you may have asked, why is this happening? Anybody ever had a why is this happening kind of day? Anybody ever had a why is this happening to me kind of year? Yes. Why is this happening to me? Why us? Why that? Why now? Why? And we don't know all the whys. We just need to know the what. Where is it that God is leading me? What is it that God is showing me? And Naaman knew all about the what. He knew all about the what, and he knew all about the where, but the number one question he had was why? Why? Why the Jordan? It's narrow, it's shallow, and it's dirty. Upon hearing the Word of God, the number one thing that he did, and by the way, there's a lot of living that takes place between verses 11 and 15. But when he heard the word of God about go dip seven times in the Jordan, the first thing he did was he was offended. He's offended at the word of God. Has the preacher ever said anything that offended you? If he preaches like he makes announcements, yes, he has. <laughs> I got offended at the announcements a few minutes ago. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Just joking, bud. Don't hurt me. Because <laughs> you've got something besides swaggity. <laughs> you, big man. Anyway, have you ever been offended at the Word of God? Have you ever been offended at the call of God on your life? The direction of God? Maybe the preacher said something and it was offensive. May I just say today that as believers in Christ, 
that are seeking to know God and walk with God, love God, believe God, trust God, follow God. We have no right to be offended. If what has been spoken is the truth and it's offensive, so be it. Could it be God's way of loving you? Could it be God's way of drawing you? Could it be God's way of showing you a change that needs to take place? But my, my friend, may I say to you, if the pastor offends you and what he said is not true, then just brush it off. But if it is true and it applies, God, what change are you bringing about in me? God, where is there that I need to go that I'm not going? God, what is there that I need to do that I'm not willing to do? God, what is it that you're showing me today? And maybe you're lost. Because Naaman's washing in the Jordan has far more to do with his salvation than his healing. Would he obey the Word of God? If you're living in sin, may I say the Word of God is always going to be offensive. If you're out of the will of God, the preaching of the gospel is always going to be offensive. If you're not where you need to be in your walk with God, whatever is said that is truth from the Word of God, it will always offend in some way because you're not where you need to be with God. And he's offended, and rightly so. Because he's an unbeliever and his offense led to isolation. The Bible says that he went away in a rage. It is easy today to get offended at the word of God from the man of God. And it is, always, it is also easy not only to be offended but to take our offense to another level. And that is to isolate ourselves. I'm not going back to church. I'm not going back to that church. I will never sit under that man's preaching again. You with me? Because I've been offended. Because I'm out of the will of God. Because I'm living in some kind of sin. Because my pride is in the way of my relationship with God. And I'm offended. And so I isolate myself. I isolate myself. I don't, I'm not going to church. I'm not involved in prayer. I'm not in fellowship with believers. I'm not involved in the things of God. I'm out of the will of God. I'm more than just out of church. I'm more than just out of fellowship. I am diving deeper into being out of the will of God. He's offended. Suddenly he isolates himself. Believers, we can't grow in isolation we need one another. We need for iron to sharpen iron. And I can tell you right now, when iron starts sharpening iron, there will always be rubbing and grinding. And that is the grinding of the Word of God. That is the offense of the Word of God. It is what Billy Graham called many years ago, the offense of the cross. It will always call us to leave our sin and to leave our disobedience, and to leave ourselves wherever we might be out of the will of God and come to Him. Amen? Amen. He's offended. He's isolated. And then He's reasoned with. <laughs> Let me just tell you right now, reasoning with folks is not as easy as it used to be. We are living in the day and time of, I'm right. And you've got to agree with me. Because this is what I think. This is what I feel. This is what I've heard. This is the way I was raised. This is the way I feel. And so that is the way it is. It is hard to reason today with unbelievers. It is really hard as well to reason with a believer out of the will of God. It's hard to reason with a believer that has been offended. It's hard to reason with a lost man that really doesn't want to be saved and he loves his sin more than he loves being saved from his sin. It is hard to reason with somebody today that doesn't want to change. It is hard to reason with somebody today that's living in immorality and quite honestly they're enjoying it. It's hard to reason with anybody that is out of the will of God and they don't want to get back in reason with him it's amazing the people God's using in this story an anonymous girl a couple of kings 
a messenger of the prophet. The prophet. And now some messengers, some attendees, if you will, some helpers, some associates, some servants of Naaman said, let me reason with you a minute. If he had told you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? Man, I'm telling you, there are blessings untold in doing the not-so-great things in obedience to the Word of God. Is anybody with me on that? If God tells us to do something great, we would do that. But the things that God blesses most, it appears to me, sometimes is the anonymous things that we do, the things that nobody knows about, the text that we send to encourage that nobody knows about, the phone call that we make, the, the visit that we make, the money that we give that nobody knows about. God seems to honor obedience to the small things in great ways. Just obey God. If he had told you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? Why not even much more then when he tells you to dip, to wash, and be clean? And so he's offended. He's isolated. He's out of the will of God. He's running. He's rebelling. He's resisting. And then he's reasoned with, and then suddenly... He's changed. Oh, the difference between what I thought and what I know. Now, if you're 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, you've lived some of that. Because at one time, you were 16, 18, 20, early 20s, you were 10 foot tall, bulletproof, and knew everything. And now, 30, 40, 50 years later, what you thought you knew, now you know. In my first church, I preached a sermon on how to raise children. I didn't have any. <laughs> oh, the difference between what I thought and what I know. Amen? Amen? I also preached a sermon one time in that same church on how to be a good husband. I was not married. <laughs> Charlie Lewis was a member of that church. He kind of talked like this. He was kind of monotone, just said, well, there's only mine. He came out one day, shook my hand. After that sermon that I had preached on how to be a good husband, I wasn't married. He's a brother of mine. I just want to tell you that maybe, maybe you ought to stick to preaching on some things you know something about. <laughs> I'll say it again. Oh, as a believer, the difference between what I thought and what I know. I am walking in so much that I know now Compared to what I thought, it's amazing. It is absolutely amazing, the goodness of God. Sometimes what I know far exceeds what I thought. Sometimes what I know is so much better than what I thought. Oh, if I only knew, now, if I only knew then what I know now, Oh, but I was busy thinking. And by the way, I'm about to be 60 years of age, and, and I'm still doing some thinking. Because I'm thinking how the next 20, 25 years, I hope, how the next rest of my life is going to turn out. I think I'm going to do this. I think we're going to do that. I think we'll travel here. I think I'll preach there. I think I'll preach this long. This is what I think will happen. This is what I think will happen with my kids. My grand this is what I think. This is the way I think it's going to work out. Check back with me. <laughs> you with me? Leave some wiggle room for God. Leave some room for change. 
Give God some elbow room. Amen? Because Naaman thought. There are a lot of people who have misconceptions about what it's like to be saved. And I did too. What I know about being saved is so much better than what I ever thought. What I know about walking with God is so much better than what I thought. What I know about trusting Him is so much better than what I thought it would be like. If you're offended, hang on. Because perception is not always reality. Ask the prodigal. He couldn't wait to get to the far country. It was his perception that that was his heart's desire. He thought that's where he needed to be. Perception is not always reality. Reality is what I know. Reality is I've been there. Reality is I've trusted him. Reality is I've had kids now. Y'all with me on that? Reality is I know things I didn't know. I have experienced grace I had never experienced. I've known the love of God in a way I never thought it could be known. Oh, what I thought. Expectations rarely resemble experience. Ask Samson. Naaman went down to the Jordan but Samson went down to Timnah because that was his far country. Samson is the Old Testament prodigal. He thought, if I can just go down to Timnah, and he did. But when he went down to Timnah, he went far deeper than he ever imagined he would go. Sometimes expectations, sometimes what we know, is far worse than what we expected and what we thought. Faith and common sense seldom agree. Walk in faith even when it don't make sense. Don't make me amen that by myself. Because <laughs> that's a good word. Walk in obedience to God, even when it don't make sense to anybody else, and may not make a lot of sense to you, but you know this is how God is leading you. The Word of God has revealed it to you. Maybe a sermon or two or three or ten has revealed it to you. Maybe odd conversations have revealed it to you. God's dealing with you. Walk in obedience to that. Even when it don't make sense. And see what happens. It ain't going to hurt you to trust God for a while. Trust Him for a while and see how that works out. Because you may have been trying to manhandle it and it hadn't worked out too. Take your hands off of it. Trust God with it and just see what might happen. Amen? He was a leper. Naaman the leper. Today, when we begin to think about Naaman, seldom, like my introduction today, seldom do we say, hey, I'm going to be talking about Naaman today. I'm going to be talking about Naaman the leper. Some folks will never forget who you were, how you lived, and what you did. So be it to the glory of God. They may remember your sin. They may remember your sickness. They may remember your setback. But may they know there was a day when you lived in surrender to Him. You gave your life to Christ. There are some folks that are never going to forget how you lived, what you did, what you said, what you were a part of. If you were a drunk, if you were a pill popper, a dope speaker, smoker, all those things that you did in the past, your immorality, there will be somebody that will remember it and bring it up at the most inconvenient times. To the glory of God, live in surrender. May they remember that. Amen? 
Naaman, we still remember you as a leper today, but you were cleansed from your leprosy. Rahab, you're not a harlot anymore, but you, we still refer to her as one. She's listed in the genealogy of Jesus, not as Rahab the harlot, but as Rahab the mother. And when he saves you, he'll save you from your sin and your shame. Amen? I'm, I'm going to be done by 2 o'clock. I promise I'll be done by 2. <laughs> God may tell you to do something he's not told anybody else to do. You're not going to be doing it because, well, this is what they're doing. Or this is what they're, where they're going. God may tell you to do something he's never told anybody else to do. There is no template when it comes to trusting God. Naaman would have never imagined dipping seven times. There is no template. There is no formula. As far as I know, Noah is the only man God ever told to build a boat before it rained. I don't know of another one that God told to do that. As far as I know, Abraham is the only man God ever told to sacrifice his only son. I don't know of another one. As far as I know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the only three that God told not to bow, and they didn't, and they're the only three that were in a fiery furnace. If there are three more, I don't know them. As far as I know, Naaman was the one person who went and dipped in the Jordan and was made clean from his leprosy. God may tell you to do something he's not telling anybody else to do. You won't know how to do it. You won't be able to read about it. There's not a book on it or a pamphlet on it. God has told you to do something, and the only way you're going to learn about it is by... I got a friend this morning... I've been praying for him. His name is Jordan. He's in his mid-30s. He wants to follow the Lord, and he's doing a, an amazing job. I talked to him yesterday. I've been praying for him about two months since I was in revival with him down in Mississippi. He said, I just want to call and tell you what God told me to do. He said, I know about what's happening in Florida with a hurricane disaster. And he said, I, I really felt like God was telling me to do something. He, he said, I got on my mind Samaritan's Purse and those, those boxes and how that, that, those things were going all over the world, those Samaritan Purse boxes. And he said, this is what I felt like God was telling me to do. He said, I felt like God told me to go buy a bunch of gas cans, five-gallon gas cans, fill them all up with gas and and write Bible verses all over those cans. And I'm going to take them to Florida and hand them out. And not only is he going to do that, he's about halfway there right now. He's got a truck loaded because people got on the bandwagon. Have you ever heard of anybody filling up gas cans and putting Scripture all over them and sending them to Florida? No! God told him to do that. There was not a book on it. <laughs> he just began to tell people, I'm going to Florida. I'm taking gas cans full of gas. We're writing scripture on them. Anybody want to help? He's got more gas cans than he can get there. God may tell you to do something he's not told anybody else to do. Amen? I'm about done. I promise. He thought. He fought. And then he saw. Behold, I thought he'll come out and wave his hands. He'll speak some religious words. He'll do some kind of an incantation. I thought he'll come out and do something great. Behold, I thought. God's will may not fit the script you've written or the narrative that you've imagined. And it certainly may not fit the end you've predicted. Trust him anyway trust him anyway anybody with me on that well say it with me trust him anyway just trust him it don't make sense this does not fit the narrative that i've imagined this does not script fit the script that i've written 
this is not fitting. The ending that I had predicted not. Behold, I thought. <laughs> now I know. He thought Elisha would be impressed. And Elisha wasn't. If Elisha had been as impressed with Naaman as Naaman was impressed with himself, Elisha wouldn't have been the prophet that we know today. Elisha didn't bow to man. He didn't answer the door of a leper like Naaman. Because here's the difference with Naaman's perspective and Elisha's perspective. Naaman saw himself as a great man who was a leper. But the prophet of God saw him as a leper who was also a great man. Don't get your name in front of your need. Always keep your need in front of your name. Your need is greater than your name. He could have stood at the door. I am Naaman, great man of valor. But what, what Elisha needed to hear was, I am a leper with a great need. He thought, God is not going to bless anything that is not his will. Amen. I will amen that. God is not going to bless anything that is not his will. Y'all write that down somewhere. I'm pretty sure that came from the Lord. It came to me. And I felt like, yes. What is it that is in my life that is not God's will? What is it that I'm doing that's not God's will? What is it that I'm allowing that's not God's will? What is it that I'm pursuing that is not God's will? He ain't going to bless it if it's not his will. David thought he was supposed to build a temple. He even got approval from Nathan the prophet, a man of God. But Nathan got troubled in his sleep and said, David's not going to do it, but his son is. Nathan had to go back and tell him he was wrong, and David had to submit to that. You're right. He's not going to bless anything that's not his will. Nathan fought against the prophet, and they will fight against the pastor. Amen to that. And they will fight against the plan. He fought against the plan, and he fought against the place. Don't fight against the will of God. Surrender to it and see what happens. This is the last thing. He sought after he thought and he went and he dipped in Jordan. He sought out the man of God to thank him and to testify. Now I know. He went. He washed. And then he worshiped. Now! I know. <laughs> He's looking back over the past few years of his life and what he had heard, what he had thought. Oh, I thought, but now I know the goodness of God. Now I know the joy of the Lord. Now I know the peace that passes. Now I know. And Naaman is mentioned one time in the New Testament. He's mentioned one time by Jesus. That's why I hesitated earlier to say he was the only one God ever told to go dip in the Jordan because I'm not sure about that. Luke 4, 27, many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. How many lepers were told to go dip in the Jordan after knocking on the door of Elisha. I don't know. I'd like to know. Could have been hundreds, could have been thousands. There were a lot of lepers. According to Luke 4.27, only one. Not everyone is going to be healed. Because not everyone is going to obey the Word of God. Not everyone is going to be saved because not everyone is going to believe. But that doesn't keep me today from preaching the truth. 
It doesn't keep me from sharing with you the promise of God that if we're obedient to truth, he will always faithfully bless our obedience to him. If you're lost today and you know you need to be saved, if you will trust him to save you sincerely, he will save you completely. Amen? And if you're out of the will of God, not where you need to be, Naaman, you've, 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 you've isolated yourself because you've been offended at this or that or them or her or him, if you'll come back to the Lord in obedience, if you'll come back and trust him to restore you, and if there is a need in your life as great as leprosy, I'm telling you, God is able. He is the healer. He is our hope. His name is above every name, and we bow to that. Amen? Let's pray. Every head bowed and every eye closed. <clears throat> I'd like to pray for you this morning. I know it's a special day. It's a big day. And I pray it could be even more special and big if God does a work in your life. Could I pray for you? I wouldn't point you out. I just want to know if I can pray for you. To lift your hand and just to put it back down. To, thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. My goodness, yes. Anybody else? Thank you. The message today, the music through heaven spoke to you. Pray for me. Anybody else? Thank you. While he strums quietly, and he's going to sing in a minute. If he just strums, would you come find a place to deal at the altar? Pray. Seek the Lord about that need in your life. Every head is bowed. Come now. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he can be found. Call on his name while he's near. Others, come on. Men, I, I would plead with you as men today, as a man to men, be the spiritual leader, your home, your family, your church. If God's dealing with you, men, lead the way. God, thank you for your grace, your goodness, your mercy, your power. Thank you for what you did in Naaman. Thank you for what you did in me. But God, if there is someone here today that needs the miracle of salvation, the miracle of restoration, the miracle of healing in their body, their life, their home, their family, may it come as we bow before you, as we dip in the Jordan, as we surrender our will to yours. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together. You come as he leads us in worship. Would you come now? Lord's dealing with your heart, would you come on now? I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thy all in Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed a white stain. Oh, now in
soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow sin life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt, who raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt, who raised this life
Jesus. 